Boxing Science TV. In this episode, we're going to be talking to flyweight prospect Carl Yusa. He's from the Ingle Gym. He's been working with Boxing Science over the last two years. We're going to be talking to him about his recent training and what his plans are for this year. And then, of course, we're going to be talking about the big fight this weekend. Everybody's talking about it all over the world. Mayweather versus McGregor. But we're going to have a little bit of a different spin on it. We're going to be talking about the science behind what McGregor actually needs to do to adapt from mixed martial arts to boxing. Then I'm going to be talking to you more about a main lift of boxing science, the deadlift. And the different variations we use to help our boxers get faster and stronger. Hello and welcome to episode 4 of Boxing Science TV. Uh, it's been a great week down at Boxing Science. We kicked it off on Monday with the Youth Summer Training Workshop where we had 8 young athletes from Sheffield City ABC uh, when we were teaching them more about strength conditioning, nutrition, recovery, all the stuff that they need to take ownership of and the big key message of the day to them was to take ownership of the program and to master the things that take no talent. And this is something that I picked up on from working with uh, sports psychologists at Sheffield Harm University and talking about controlling controllables and not focusing on the uncontrollables. And what I mean by that, the controllables is stuff like your diet, your hydration, uh, your sleep, your recovery. Only you can be responsible for that, especially if you're an amateur or upcoming professional you can't afford the services of sports scientists and nutritionists watching your every move. You know, you've got to control and take ownership of them parts of your program. And these will stack up your 10% to make you a better athlete. When I work with golf, my main selling point to them is that you'd like to buy a driver that's like £400, £500, something like that, to add 1% onto your uh, golf swing, your club head speed, but you know you don't manage your nutrition right, you don't manage your strength training, you don't do your mobility, uh, you don't manage your recovery between rounds. These are things that can have a massive impact and they cost nothing. So making sure that you're doing the simple things right will help you become an all-round athlete. And this is something that I, I preach to the to the young athletes because having this attitude and this work ethic and focusing on the things that they can control and the stuff that doesn't require any talent will help them go a long way in the sport. So we had a lot of different workshops to educate them, to uh, empower them to do the training methods at home. We had a nutrition workshop from Lee Rickards and he got the young athletes to recognise why they should be having certain foods at different times and to recognise the difference between good foods and bad foods. They took a booklet home with them so they can revise what they learned on that day and they've been given the tools to help them fulfill their potential. Okay, we're here with the golden kid, Carl Yusuf. Carl, how are you doing? I'm doing alright, how are you? Yeah, I'm good time, mate. So what stage are you in your training? Um, three or four weeks in? Uh, uh, what kind of stuff have you been doing? Well, I've had a bit of time off after my last fight, you know, due to Ramadan and just went on a little break myself but I got back into training about three, three, three four weeks into it and uh, obviously I got right back into it. It's been hard but us as fighters we need hard training so far it's been good. A lot of building on my legs you know I'm trying to build the strength up now you know because obviously my last fight was a six rounder but from now on that was the first half of the fight and now from, I'm going to start going from 6 to 12 rounds so mm. you know I need them legs to be strong and just all round fitness. And in the blue corner winning red shorts with gold, official weight 8 so 2 pounds 9 ounces. Perfect record. 10 wins, no defeats, 5 inside the distance. From Sheffield, the golden kick. Very big show with uh, fighting on the Kelbrook undercard, and uh, you know my biggest fight today against Louis Norman, a kid who's uh, he's been against, he's been in against very good fighters, but obviously he come up against me, and like they said, he fell short. 
a few times before and I said to him before the fight, you're going to fall short again. Mm. And after he said to me, I was, I was probably one of the strongest kids he's been in with. But all in all, it was, it was, a, good, it was, a, good, it was a good show, good performance from me and uh, a lot of people are talking about me now. Good stuff and uh, you, got, you got a good knockdown in that fight. You know, do you feel like you're, you're punching quite hard? Well, um, I ain't gonna say I punch hard, but the people around me say I punch hard. So, and obviously my opponent told me, mm. but I just couldn't. I just needed the icing on the cake. I, I needed mm. to finish him, but it wasn't quite there. But hopefully next time. And what was it like boxing on such a, a big card in, in Sheffield, in your hometown? Well, um, to be honest, it, it was a it was a, bit, a very big thing for me. Like, I'm not used to this. I'm always. I'm used to fighting on small old shows, but this was a very big opportunity for me. So it did feel quite weird, but at the same time, it was exciting and it was good. Yeah, it sets you up for for big things in the future. So, what's the plan over the next twelve months? What are your what are your goals? The next twelve months, well, uh, I'm looking to get back into fighting zone in October, and hopefully, end of year or even beginning of next year, hopefully, get a title, start wiping that division out. Good stuff, man. So we're going to start with his first steps towards that by uh, doing doing your curve session. <laughs> Good stuff, Carl. Cheers for talking to us. Thank you. It's great hearing from Kyle there, it's a really good prospect in the flyweight division and he's, he's really really strong, really explosive, you know, he's lifting uh, nearly twice his body weight uh, for reps on the deadlift and when he's throwing the landmine punch it really hurts my hands, he's throwing it as fast as uh, people that are a few weights above him, if not about several weights above him as well. Really strong, explosive and talented at the same time. Hopefully he's going to be pushing for titles within the next 12 months. So that brings us on to our uh, topic of the week and where else but look than the massive money fight in Mayweather versus McGregor. It's a fight on everybody's lips. Every interview that I see, fighters are getting asked, what's your opinion on Mayweather versus McGregor? And when deciding what the topic of the week this week was, I was deliberating whether to mention Mayweather versus McGregor because I don't want to be sucked in into the media hype but what I wanted to share with you is a few stats that we collected in when we did the article for science behind McGregor beating Mayweather and with that title we might have uh, uh, tripped up a little bit because people thought well what are you on about McGregor's got no chance of beating him what we wanted to show is what does McGregor actually have to do to adapt from mixed martial arts to boxing to have a chance of beating Mayweather. We wanted to write an article of the research that we'd have done if we got a phone call from Team McGregor that, right, Boxing Science, we want you to help us adapt to the physical demands of boxing uh, from MMA. A few of the numbers that stand out to, for what McGregor actually needs to adapt to. We got some great data from uh, Danny Snow and he's been doing a study on the, si the different size of the rings and how that affects physical performance. What he found, the difference between a 14 foot ring and an 18 foot ring, that in the smaller area, uh, boxers experience higher heart rates and higher blood lactates and the increase in physical interactions, either hitting landing or getting shots thrown at them as well. So, real increased demands in this, in this smaller space. So Mayweather's ring against Pacquiao was a 20 foot by 20 foot ring, so 400 square feet. Now the UFC octagon is 750 square feet. So we're talking about a much smaller area than McGregor is used to. So if it's, t I'm not sure what the ring size is gonna be. I'm guessing that it will be uh, 20 by 20. So you're looking at some real increase in uh, physical demands and physical interactions than what McGregor's normally used to 
in the UFC octagon. Now we can't really compare uh, strike rates and punch rates uh, round by round because obviously it's five five rounds, five five minute rounds in uh, UFC and mixed martial arts and in boxing 12 by 3 minutes rounds so the punch stats are going to be quite different for uh, Mayweather and McGregor but we did compare strike rates per minute within a bout and there's not much difference between Mayweather and McGregor. Mayweather gets 11.9 punches per minute whereas McGregor has 12 strikes per minute. Uh, we're not sure the punches and uh, kicks but it's 12 strikes per minute so not much difference between the two. Now there is a big difference between uh, McGregor and Mayweather's opponents and uh, one opponent in particular the closest person to be beating Mayweather is Marcus Maidana. Now, Maidana threw so many punches uh, at him, it just was relentless. In fact, it works out to being 23.8 punches per minute. That's almost double what McGregor's punch or strike per minute rate is. So, if McGregor's looking at, right, what's the the blueprint or uh, the way to beat Mayweather, there isn't one at the moment. Um, you'd look to try and replicate what the person did that was closest to beating him. Now, Maidana, 23.8 punches per minute. McGregor, 12 strikes per minute. So, McGregor's got to improve almost double. So, McGregor's almost got to double his strike rate to replicate the man that nearly beat Mayweather. So you're talking a, a, a huge increase in physical demands for McGregor to beat Mayweather. It's not just because it's 12 rounds, it's not just because he's uh, going in a ring and having eight ounce gloves on. It's about the amount of strikes that he's got to throw to be successful to land enough shots on Floyd Mayweather. And it seems quite a big task. Now from this data, we actually constructed our own eight week conditioning program for what we'd give McGregor. If McGregor came to uh, our labs, this is the kind of training that we do with him. We'd gone for high intensity sprints, some muscle buffering work, some anaerobic work, uh, some real high intensity uh, conditioning drills. And this is not only to improve uh, the, how the muscle extracts and utilizes energy but it's also given to get more bang for your buck to get the biggest adaptation in the shortest amount of time and you know looking on social media has McGregor done this it's gone quite low intensity for for my liking it looks to be doing a lot of stuff on the bike the what bike low intensity running uh, and it's been doing some outdoor cycling as well we get asked questions about cycling for boxing, you know, it's full body workout end of the day boxing, it demands a lot of energy on the legs, so to take that impact off, yeah we do cycling sometimes, but only in certain scenarios, whether uh, we need to reduce impact on the joints and on the legs, so we probably do it for recovery, uh, if an athlete is injured, if a, if a boxer's going through some high loads in sparring, we might do the bike, but we, we more or less uh, stick to the treadmill, the curved treadmill, or uh, some track work. So why is McGregor doing the cycling? Well, I think that, obviously he had ACL injury, uh, that might put him off. Uh, ACL, I think he did his ACL back in 2014, 2015. So that might put him off from running. Also that his team, the Conor McGregor fast team, their, group, their team of like ex-cyclists, you know, that's what they believe in. So that counts a lot for it. And the other thing is that they probably could cycle him more than he could run. What I mean is, is that the, uh, the amount of fatigue and impact forces that come with running, uh, it's not getting as much from the cycling. So he's able to train more cycling, probably 
able to do more conditioning sessions so it will be able to get fitter in a short amount of time and I think that you know that counts a lot for the amount of variation that's been in his training you've seen him on in underwater treadmills you've seen him on what bikes you've seen him cycling outside as well there's been a lot of variation now, now is this randomness or is it actually structured training variation now when an athlete is becoming um, uh, fatigued or needs to get fit in a short amount of time we rely on training variation quite a lot so we can get a high training load without having the training monotony as well is it random is it structured training variation i'm not sure uh, my opinion on the mayweather versus mcgregor fight is interesting it's going to be really interesting to see uh you know whether mayweather's has still got in the in the tank he's 40 years old he's been out of the ring for uh, 23 months and almost two years uh, McGregor's fresh, uh, 29, I still don't think that's enough. What I do know is that McGregor is a fighter, he's tough. The amount of self-belief that he's got, he's not going to like, lie down. He's going to be coming forward at Mayweather. Don't be uh, surprised if he does a lot better than what people expect. He's not just going to get absolutely wiped out. Uh, but I think that towards the back end of the fight, he will be uh, very, very tight because, like I said, he's going to have to give it to Mayweather um, to not only rattle him, but to, to land enough punches on him as well. So, you know, don't be surprised if it goes past six. It does a lot better than what people expect, but... He will tire out and whether he's, uh, whether Mayweather gets a stoppage or he retires on his stool, I'm not sure. But I'm pretty sure that the most people that are watching this are going to be tuning in. So enjoy the fight. The exercise of the week is the deadlift. Now we could talk about this all day because the deadlift is one of the top exercises within strength conditioning uh, throughout all sports but it can also be very dangerous uh, because you know the lo amount of loading on the back people can get too weight mad put a load of weight on the bar and affect the posture and, you know this can be really dangerous and you know boxers have a lot of movement issues because uh, of the amount of training load that they've done and the little training history that they have within strength conditioning and they go right what's the biggest move to do and that's either a squat, a deadlift, bench press they've got strong backs, strong shoulders so they can shift some weight on the deadlift uh, not with great form uh, so the deadlift is a really popular exercise to boxers that are like on the fringes of doing strength conditioning and it's often done wrong now is uh, my controversial thing, my philosophy on, on deadlifts when an athlete gets to a certain level I don't deadlift them from the floor and you know it's, it's weird because it's like a, a little bit of a inverted U U shape or whatever I don't know but basically when they first start I don't get them deadlifting from the floor because they have to improve their foundational movement first uh, and then when they improve their foundational movement I get them deadlifting from the floor because I feel like it's still a key movement for them to develop especially when we're going to get them onto Olympic lifting variations in the future and then once they go beyond that coming back down and they're more experienced at lifting they're getting stronger they're lifting more weight I don't get them deadlifting from the floor now I do get them trap bar deadlifting from the floor and the trap bar is a really good variation because uh, because of the neutral grip boxers struggle with their shoulders so when they've got a bar in front of them and they're trying to pull back they're going to be struggling in this anterior shoulder here they want it to be using the traps a lot more so they struggle with that scapular retraction and using the lats more within their uh, pulling exercise so 
having the shoulders in a neutral position, boxers are able to lift more weight on the deadlift and you know we're not looking to make our boxers into power lifters. We're looking to get them stronger and faster. What's the point in doing a straight bar deadlift and it's because it looks good, it's great. Uh, you know, I still do deadlifts in, in my programs, uh, but if there's not much point to it, we can get stronger and faster from different exercise, then I'm gonna pick that. So the hex bar or hex bar or trap bar, whatever you call it in your gym is my preferred way of lifting from the floor. I do still use a straight bar in uh, the rack Romanian deadlift or normal Romanian deadlift. The Romanian deadlift is a really good exercise to improve someone's hip hinge pattern, hip hinge strength, targeting the hamstrings and the glutes. Whereas the normal deadlift, you know, the boxers are really strong within their quads. So they're gonna be wanting to use their quads more and we're not developing um, the hamstrings or the glutes as much. So using the Romanian deadlifts, uh, you know, has, has been really beneficial. And using the rack RDL has been really beneficial in them being able to lift more weight uh, for over a shorter distance and being able to get themselves set in a much strong position uh, at the knees. Now, if they were going to a normal Romanian deadlift, you see a lot of breaking posture on a lot lighter weight. The rack. Uh, RDL variation helps them set the scaps back, brace their core, push through the floor and they're able to lift a lot more weight so we're getting a lot more adaptation. So they're the reasons why I use the trap bar deadlift and the Romanian deadlift within the boxing science programs. Like I say, we still use the straight bar deadlift because I feel that it's an important movement to keep uh, improving and increasing our strength on. If you still want to favour deadlifts, then you know still still do it, but just gotta be careful. You know, there's a risk versus benefit thing. So if I can reduce the risk and get the same benefit from different exercise, I'm gonna use that because I want them to be stronger and faster, but I don't want them injured at the same time. And if you are wanting to use a deadlift in your program, then take a look on how I'd coach a deadlift from the floor. You're going to start off with feet hip width apart, with the bar lined up with the first shoelace of your shoe. You're going to sit down into a deadlift position, which is shoulders are just in front of the bar, hips are just above your knees, and the weight's going through the centre of your foot. You're going to tense up with your shoulders and pull the slackness out of the bar, and then you can drive up through your heels, extending your hips and your knees simultaneously. Chest up, shoulders back, push through the floor. Good, yeah, just for that service. Yeah, so see with Rizard, he was extending his hips and his knees at the same time. He was providing a lot of tension through his core. And at the top, he was really squeezing his, his hips by tensing his glutes. All right, so a common deadlift mistake is the rounding the shoulders once you start lifting the bar. A good little tip for this is to make sure you pull the slack out the bar before you lift. So what I do I mean by that is when you come down, there's basically a lot of people end up being loose and pulling the bar and yanking at the bar and then this alters the posture. But what I want them to do is to pull the chest out, pull the shoulders back and that's as though you're lifting before you lift. Okay, so you're pulling the slack out of the bar, you're tensing up all your shoulders, start pulling the bar and provide tension through the legs before you lift. So this makes sure that you keep a nice straight back all the way through the lift. I hope that clip has been beneficial for you and it's going to be helpful for you to perform deadlifts within your gym. That clip's taken from our coaching videos which uh, featured within our five pound SNC start pack. You can access this in the link below. We've got loads more information there, like a movement program and myself commentating over a strength conditioning session with Kid Galahad. And this will help you kickstart your training. And that's all we've got time for this week. Thanks very much for watching. 
If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe. We've got plenty more videos that we post regularly through the week. We do Boxing Science TV once per week. And, you know, please share or like this video as well, uh, whether it's on your social media or with friends or with colleagues as well. Because the reason why we're doing this is because we want to make the best sport in the world even better through applied sports science into your training. Okay, cheers guys, catch you next week.